Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 1? Sister Barb is going to come and read this over us, and God willing, into us, so that it would be a part of us. Before the reading and the time and the word, let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we come to your word, the truth of what you have done and what you have said, and especially through your Son. You have won us to yourself through him. You have convinced us that he is Lord. So I pray that as he speaks and as we read of what he's done, you'll strike us to the heart, Lord, that we would be ready and eager to do all that you call us to do to please you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give our attention to the reading of the word. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Amen. Thank you, Barb. So this morning we're going to begin, and who knows how long it'll take, and I'm not really concerned about that. We're going to begin a journey through the book of Acts. Now the reason for this is I've been really wrestling with the Lord in prayer a lot about where where do we go from here as a church. Uh, It's been several years now that uh, we've been laying the groundwork of the vision, the vision of what God's been up to since he created all things leading to the new creation. We've been talking about what it means, what Jesus did, and what is the gospel, and how does it fit into God's great design for what he's been doing. And so looking at that for three years, I'm hoping that we have that foundation laid, and now the question is, what now? What's the plan? Where do we go from here? It's tempting as a pastor to just come up with one and say, here's the plan, let's go. Of course, the problem with that is that if it's my plan, it's almost certain to fail at some point. It might start off with a bang and look really flashy and good, but it will fail. Amen? I won't take offense. It's okay. If I give you a plan and I come up with it myself, I don't know how long it will take, but it will fall flat. However, if it is the purpose and plan of our master, it's going to go. And I don't know how long it might take to take off the ground, but once it does, it's going to fly. And that's, interestingly, what I think the uh, original apostles and disciples of Jesus were facing in this passage that Barb read for us in Acts chapter 1. Did you notice at the very beginning, Luke, who wrote this as well as the Gospel of Luke, go figure, uh, it's a two-part book. So the first part, which is our Gospel of Luke, is as he says here. It starts with Jesus. And it ends with his ascension. So if you go to the end of the book of Luke, you'll see that. Jesus went up back to Father. So here, after he gives a quick summary, previously in Luke, right? I mean, he does that. This is what I did in my first book. Now I'm going to pick it up from there, Luke says. I want to tell you what happened once Jesus left. 
Now, as he's describing the interaction between the disciples and the resurrected Jesus before Jesus goes back to Father, did you notice that the the disciples are given instruction by Jesus? I, I want to look at it with you again. Look at verse 4 with me. Jesus tells them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. These are the instructions. But receiving instructions doesn't mean you know the plan. It just means you know what to do next. That's not a plan necessarily. It's just the next step of the plan. They still don't really know what the plan is. And I want to, don't miss this, please. This is very easy to skip. But in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, it says that Jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of how many days? Do you see it there? Forty days. That's not an accident. That number comes up a lot. Forty days, right? Forty days, God decides to let his resurrected son stay on planet earth before returning to his glory in heaven. While Jesus is on earth in his resurrected body, with all the things he could be doing for those 40 days, what does he decide to do for 40 days? What is he talk, talking to his disciples about? Do you see it? It's the kingdom of God. Why should that not be shocking? Because for the three and a half-ish years he was walking around in mortal flesh and blood, what was he talking about? Kingdom of God. What were his miracles demonstrating? Kingdom of God. He was obsessed. And of course he was. This was the biggest announcement ever to be made in the human story. Repent for the kingdom of the heavens, or the kingdom of God is at hand. It's come. It's here now. Now, if you don't know what that means, of course, it's not that exciting. If you have any idea what that means, this is the biggest thing ever. Okay? This is, this is going to change everything. But I would invite you to consider with me what it might have been like, and I don't know for sure either, but I'm trying to piece it together. What would it have been like for these earliest disciples who heard Jesus announce that? They had heard John the baptizer announce it before Jesus. This is obviously huge. God is on the move. Something cataclysmic is going to be going on with the kingdom of God arriving. And then they watch as Jesus demonstrates how true it is as he's healing every physical ailment and disability they could throw at him. Amen? Was there anyone brought to Jesus that he looked at him and went, Oh, this one's beyond me. I hope, I hope you can find somebody else, but I'm sorry, I can't touch this. Is, was there anyone Jesus had to turn away because it spent his abilities? Every disease, every sickness with a touch, with a word. Now, if you see someone doing that town to town, village to village, you might start getting the idea, maybe the kingdom of God message is true. But it wasn't just physical bodies being healed. These people that were possessed, owned by these... Uh, unclean spirits or demons that no one else could could deal with because we're humans and they're spirits and their incantations and all that wasn't working. Those spirits that had taken possession of human beings made in God's image, when they saw Jesus, how did they respond to him with their spiritual insight? What did they do when they saw Jesus? They would fall down before him and they would beg him for mercy. What? And then... When it was time for them to go, and Jesus always knew when that time was, what did Jesus have to do to make those spirits obey? He would speak. That's all. No magic scrolls that he had to unroll and read in the old ancient language, you know, and there was no mantra he had to speak. He spoke to the spirit, go, never come back. And the Spirit had to obey Him. When you see that happen over and over again, you start thinking, okay, maybe there's something to this kingdom message. Okay, something huge is happening. But was that all? No! He meets people who are mourning their dead, and what can Jesus do if He so chooses? Well, it depends on who it is. In one instance, He he yells an authoritative command to a tomb where His friend Lazarus has been in there for four days. Do you think this is just a mistake? Oopsie, we buried a dead guy. Look, after four days, I think we can be sure. When he calls him out and they move the stone, Lazarus walks out still wrapped in his death cloth. 
There's another time Jesus encountered in a city called, or in a town called Nain, he walks up to a woman who's grieving bitterly because she's a widow and she has only one child, one son, and he's dead, laid out and being carried to his resting place. And she's overwhelmed, of course, with this grief because this is true any time a woman loses her only child or any child, but especially in that time, in that place, this woman now had nothing and no one. And she is grieving with the bitterest of grief. And Jesus, without even being invited, no one begged him to do this. He walks up, he puts his hand on the woman and says, don't cry. Excuse me? And then he gives her a reason not to cry. He walks over to the dead young man. He puts his hand on him and says, young man, get up. And what did that dead young man do? He obeyed the master. He got up and, and, and Jesus reintroduced the son to her mother, to his mother. And oh, what a miraculous change. Why? Because the kingdom has come. There is one more time we know of, at least. There's this 12-year-old girl. And look, I have a 12-year-old girl. So this story will sock you in the face. You know what I mean? This religious leader, oh my gosh, this socks me a second time in the face. A religious leader with a 12-year-old daughter goes to Jesus because she's on her deathbed and begs Jesus, will you come heal her? No, we've tried everything. No one can help. Will you do it? I've heard some things about you. And you're talking about the kingdom come. Can you, can you do something? So he says, do you want me to go to your house? Sure. They start going. On their way to the house, someone comes over to Jesus and to Jairus, and they say, uh, Master Jairus, don't bother the rabbi. She's already gone. What could he do? It's too late. I don't know Jairus' reaction, but I do know Jesus' reaction to his reaction. He said, don't be afraid. Just trust me. Okay. So they keep going to Jairus' house. Do you know the story? They walk in, and they already have mourners. They already have mourners wailing loudly because of this young life is snuffed out. Jesus, I'm always bothered by what he says here, but hey, he's the master. He says, you need to leave now. Why are, you, why are you so upset? And they're like, what do you mean, why are we upset? She's not dead, she's just sleeping. What? We know what a dead person is? And so anyways, he, he goes into the room where the daughter is with just Jairus, just the mom, and three of his close disciples. And oh my gosh, oh, if you could, oh, if we could have been there. He takes her little hand, probably still warm. And he says in Aramaic, little girl, get up. And Luke's the only one to tell us this. Her spirit returned to her. I don't know where her spirit had been for those moments that she had been dead, but wherever it was, it heard its master's voice, Jesus, call it back, and the spirit came back, returned to her. She gets up, and I love this. Jesus says, you should give her some food. (laughs) Apparently death makes you hungry. Okay. Now, why do I go through those stories? Jesus announces the kingdoms here. He heals bodies of any issue that they have. He casts out demons with an authoritative word. He can raise dead people just by telling them to get up. Is that all? He's on a boat. A storm is raging. A kind of storm that will make expert fishermen pee themselves. You know what I mean? Like This is like we're going to die time on this squall on the waters. Jesus is sleeping. Look, he worked hard. Cut him a break. So he's sleeping through the storm. In their panic, these professional uh, men of the boat, these fishermen, they go to Jesus and wake him and say, don't you care, we're about to die. Do something. And how did Jesus deal with this impossible situation? He stood up and he got out his magic scroll. Is that what he did? He called upon the spirits of the waters. and No, he said, stop it. He rebuked it. I don't know what he said exactly, but he rebuked it. Stop it. And when nature itself heard the master speak, what did nature do? It obeyed. It calmed down. And it was still. When Jesus had to feed a large crowd. Now, we know there were 5,000 men. We don't know how many people total there were. So let's, let's be on the conservative side. Let's say 7,500 people. And he wanted to feed them because they'd been there with him a long time. And they're going to get hungry on their way home. They got to walk, and they didn't come prepared for this. So he tells his disciples, feed them. And they're like, what? 
First of all, we, if we went to go buy food for them, where would we find that much food, and how could we afford it? They, they're living in the natural. They don't get it. So Jesus says, okay, okay. He's so patient with them. He's like, let me show you what I'm talking about. How much food do we have on hand? They go do a little research. What did they find? How much food could they find? Five loaves, two fish, 7,500 people. Look, I'm sure they didn't take trigonometry class, but that you don't need any of that to know. This is a problem, okay? <laughs> five loaves, and I'm talking loaves, not loaves. Five loaves, two fish, 7,500 people. On the conservative end, Jesus is not worried. Why? After he thanks the Father for the food and blesses it, he starts dishing it out to 12 baskets. And as he's dishing it out, he just keeps dishing it out. Where, how, where does it go? I don't understand how this worked, but he just kept dishing out the food, fills the 12 baskets. They walk around a whole crowd seated, and they feed everyone to satisfaction. And when the disciples are done handing out the food, how much food is still there? The baskets are still full. It's like nothing was used. What is happening? No matter what Jesus encountered, he would show the kingdom message is true because he would demonstrate it by the Spirit's power. Look at what God's up to. All the rules you're used to are now being turned upside down. Why do I talk about this? Because in those early days of Jesus' resurrection, this is all the disciples have known. Jesus has announced and proven the kingdom's here. And what they're expecting is, he's going to take over now. Rome is going down. Israel is going up. The kingdom in their mind is literally a government of human power. Jesus at the top. And who are they thinking will be right by his side? They will, obviously. They're his guys. In fact, they're so convinced of this, what was one of their common arguments as they walked around together? Who's going to be the closest to his side when this all goes down? And I think Peter had a pretty good claim on that after a while, but they still had a debate because John and James are very close to Jesus also. I don't know where Judas fit into that, but he was wrong, whatever he was thinking. So these men are so convinced Jesus is going to take over that they're vying for positions in his cabinet when he's king. Now, when Jesus tells them at the end of Luke, and Luke has written all this down ahead of this, this second part of his writing, he's written down that when Jesus tells his, his men that he is going to go to Jerusalem, be rejected, suffer, and die, and then rise again, did they understand what he meant? They actually asked this question. I wonder what he means by rise again. They thought he's speaking in parables, he's a rabbi, he speaks in riddles a lot. What does he mean by this? Let's crack the code. What does it mean that he's going to suffer, die, and rise again? Hmm. Figuratively speaking, maybe this and maybe that. They couldn't get it. And when it's time for Jesus to be arrested and mocked and put on false trials and assigned to execution on a Roman cross, they were so confused, discouraged, and defeated because this is not the plan. The kingdom of God has come. Our Messiah is doing miracles beyond anyone's imagination to prove it, and now he's dead. At the hands of the Romans? What? And at the end of Luke, when Jesus meets in his resurrected body, he meets two disciples. Not, not, the, not any of the 12 apostles, two other disciples. And he, in disguise, he's walking along with them. They say those very telling words. We had thought he was the one. They were talking about Jesus to Jesus. They just didn't know that. So they're talking about Jesus to the stranger. And when, they, when they're telling him what's been going on in Jerusalem, why they're so downcast, they say of Jesus to his face, we thought, past tense, he was the one. Now, if they say we thought past tense, what does that mean present tense? We realize we must be wrong. Because if he was the true king of Israel, the true Messiah promised by God through all the prophets, through all these centuries, he would not have died on a cross by the power of Rome. That could never happen. So now when Jesus reveals himself as the resurrected Lord and he confirms that they were right in the first place, he is the one, and that whole death thing was a total curveball. No one saw that coming. What I'm, what I'm going all through this to say is when you get to, act, to Acts chapter 1 
And Jesus, the resurrected one, is still talking about the kingdom now that he's resurrected. Do you not think those original disciples need to do a reset of what God's plan is? They thought they knew. The crucifixion curveball comes, the resurrection curveball comes, and I think they've reached the point where like, we have no idea what to expect anymore. <laughs> we thought we knew. We thought we understood where God was going with all this. He's obviously changing everything we thought he was up to. And so now, as Jesus is talking with them, their burning question is, so what is the plan here? The kingdom's obviously still, still come. You're alive from the dead, so things are definitely changing. Where do we go from here? The mission still needs to be accomplished. The world still needs to know. In fact, did you even did you see what their question to Jesus was? They still are operating under their old plan. They think that the crucifixion resurrection is just a hiccup. Get it? Let's get back to the original plan, Jesus. Look what they asked in verse 6. Lord, are you at this time... Now that we've gone through the weird crucifixion and resurrection stuff, are you now at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, let's get back to what we really are looking at, Jesus. Israel being on top, Rome going down. Yippee! Jesus doesn't deny that's going to happen. But what's his answer? Look at verse 7 with me. It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. How might we say that in modern parlance? It's none of you. Okay? It's none of your business. That's not for you. That is above your pay grade. You don't need to know when. What you need to know is what to do right now in the meantime. So all of this is to say to you, my brothers and sisters, and certainly to me, if we ever wonder what's, what's God's plan for us, if we have in mind his vision, his grand overall design and vision, but we're not exactly sure what to do with that in this moment, we're in good company. Because our original brothers and sisters of the faith were in that same exact spot. And Jesus did not enlighten them except for one or two steps ahead of them. So let's take a look at the master's plan as he gave it to them. What was the first thing he told them to do? He said, stay in Jerusalem and wait. Waiting is our favorite thing in the world. Am I right? No. Especially in our modern age, but it's never been true, I don't think, of humans. We just we have more reason to expect things faster than other generations, maybe. But I don't think it's ever been a human desire to wait for things. Because if you want it... Of course, it's better to have it now than later. And yet Jesus, who is Lord of heaven and earth, is telling these men, I've got something amazing for you. The Father's promised you many times already that it's coming, but you still have to wait. And I love the way he puts it. He says they're going to have to wait just a little while, not very long. Here's the timeline. Jesus is killed around Passover, right? Right? Very powerful symbolism there, is there not? Our Passover lamb, so that death will pass over us. So he's, he's killed around Passover time. He's resurrected that first day of the week, Sunday after that Passover. Now, in 50 days, there is going to be a Jewish holiday called Pentecost. For 40 of those 50 days, Jesus is there with them in the resurrected body he's been given. So how many days are left till Pentecost, roughly? we got 10 days to go. Wait for 10 days for the greatest gift you will ever receive that will make all of God's plans possible. How are you feeling if you're told 10 days till the greatest mind-blowing thing ever comes your way? Oh, it's like Christmas morning times a thousand and it's 10 days away. Now, here's what's interesting. We're not there yet, but spoiler alert. What do they do for those 10 days? Do they go out and tell everyone that Jesus is alive? No. He didn't tell them to do that. Did they, what, go to the temple and offer a bunch of sacrifices day after day, waiting for the great gift to come in 10 days or so? No. They go back to that little upper room where they had that last supper with Jesus. 
And they and the other disciples who know he's alive get together up there. And what do they do for that whole time, just about the whole time they're waiting? They pray. They get into the presence of the living God and Messiah at his right hand and they lay themselves out and they desperately seek his face because they still really don't know what to do. So brothers and sisters, I think this is a powerful point for us to consider. If we're not exactly sure what to do, we know God's up to great things and he's got great things in store for us, but we're not exactly sure what it is. What does the early church show us is one of the best things we can ever do? Pray. And I don't mean two-minute prayers, check off the list prayers. I'm talking lay yourself out for extended periods of time together kind of prayer. We're talking about the kind of prayer that has always preceded the revivals of the history of the church. Every single great movement that we've seen where there's this massive movement of the Spirit to change multitudes of people, guess what always was at the very beginning of that? Where did it always start? What was the seed? It was a group of people. And the number varies, but it's always consistently this. A group of people who trust God and know he's up to something but aren't sure what it is, they get together and for extended periods of time and for many, whatever the length of time and days it is, they will devote themselves to seek his face. So, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking on this. It's not only in Acts, it's the whole story of the church. This is the way God does big things. This is from the birthing place of the great things God's up to. You can probably draw the same conclusion I can. Oh my gosh, I think maybe we should do that. What do you think? Now I know you're kind of hesitant to answer, just like me. Because if I say yes to that question, that means I should do it. And if I should do it, that means I'm going to. And if I'm going to, you know what that means? My life is going to get really interrupted. Are you with me? Look, this is not life as usual, unless you do this all the time. And please teach me, because I don't. I am not on my face before the Lord all the time. I'm, I'm trying to serve him. And it's a very busy thing to serve the Lord, right? At home and, and, and whatever work you do and, and all this. When you try to serve the Lord and live your life, it's a very busy prospect. And the idea that these people who actually could have been doing a lot to be productive for Jesus, they decided to do what seems like the most unproductive thing in the world. They got together and prayed for days. But at the end of the 10-day-ish waiting period, what did Jesus, with the authority of the Father, what did he pour out on his people? This is what Jesus said to wait for, and it was promised by John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer, who was baptizing people in the waters of the Jordan so that they could be forgiven of their sins, washed clean. This was for the Jews. This wasn't for Gentiles. This wasn't to convert anybody to Judaism. This was to the people already Jewish saying, you need to return to what you vowed to God so long ago. You need to come back to the covenant. Be faithful, because y'all are missing it. That was John's job. Revival in Israel. And he said, I baptize you with water. But listen now. There is one. And he didn't even know who it was yet. There is one who's coming. Just after me. And I am not even worthy to bend over and untie his sandal. That's how much greater than me he is. He will baptize you with what? Do you remember the two things in, according to Luke's passage? with the Holy Spirit and fire. Whoa, read Acts chapter 2. Hello, right? John knew as a prophet, God told him ahead of time, whomever that Holy, that Holy Spirit comes down and lands on as a dove, he's the one who's going to baptize with the Spirit. John knew. Jesus knew. They kept telling people it's coming. And now Jesus says, wait. And what has been promised all this time, you're finally going to be able to experience it. But which aspect of the Spirit's coming did Jesus emphasize here in Acts chapter 1? You will receive... It's on the screen. Can you see it? You will receive power. 
why, of all the things the Holy Spirit represents to us, why do you suppose Jesus emphasizes this? The Spirit brings comfort, does He not? Come on, Spirit-filled people, have you ever felt His comfort? His presence with you? When no one else can give you comfort. No one understands you. They've gone through similar things, but never exactly what you're going through. And they're saying words to you, and they seem to just bounce off you. Like, nothing seems to bring any comfort. There is this person who is so near to you, he's actually inside you, in your flesh and bone. He's there within you, in the inner recesses of your inner self that you don't even understand. He's there. He fully understands you. And when he speaks to you and he moves in you, he does something no one else can do. Why didn't Jesus emphasize that ministry of the Spirit? Why didn't he emphasize the fact that the Spirit will give you ideas you would never have on your own? Anybody experienced that before? Like you're talking to someone, they really need you to give them words of wisdom, and something comes out of your mouth, you're like, that was amazing. I've never had that thought before in my life. Where did that? Oh, I know where. Like when you know the Spirit's just giving you these ideas and these words to speak, and you're like, I was a vessel. I was a vessel. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Why didn't Jesus emphasize that? Well, all of that is tied into this one thing. And listen, brothers and sisters, if Jesus was primarily concerned with those first disciples being okay, he would have said a lot of different things, not power. When he said, you will receive power, when he emphasized that part of the Spirit's role, what was Jesus really getting at? The reason the Spirit needed to come was not primarily to make sure these disciples would feel okay. It was so that they could do what they were called to do. Amen? Are you with me? This is a mission. This is about calling. Why do I emphasize that this morning? Because some of us, and I don't know who you are, not picking on anybody, but I know this is true in any group of disciples, I'm sure, there are some of us who actually are still in that part of our discipleship maturing process where we can't see past its benefit to us. And when we think about the Holy Spirit being given to us, we're still focused on the fact we have him to benefit us. I want to make sure we don't get stuck there. If you're there right now, okay, let's move on from there because what Jesus shows us is the Spirit's coming is not just about comforting us or helping us be righteous or helping us get through our days in power. It's so that when he unleashes us into the world to accomplish the kingdom mission that's still going, we can. Because let me ask you, and I'm going to close it here, but let me ask you, if Jesus unleashed you on the world with your own intelligence, your own experience, your own energy and power, would you be able to do his mission? Look, I struggle just to do my own mission. Are you with me? I I struggle just to make sure my calendar is fulfilled in my own power. Are you? My goodness. You want me to take on an eternal kingdom of God mission that means changing lives, healing families, restoring communities? You want me to try to do that from in here? Ooh, that's a joke. So how how could he have the gall to call human beings like me to be a part of this massive, eternal, supernatural effort? It's because he said, when I call you to do something impossible, I will give you the power to make it possible. This is how he operates. Amen? Come on. So, two pieces of the puzzle I have so far just from this text. If you would like to ask me, hey, pastor, what's the plan? What are we up to? What are we going to be doing? Come on. we got the vision in mind. We know what the Lord wants to get done. What are we going to do? I'll say, me too. I'm wondering, let's ask. Let's a- but who do you ask? If the pastor doesn't know, if, if you go to the elders, like, what's the plan, elders? What are we going to do? And they're like, we're figuring that out too. And I don't want to speak for them. Let's just say. Well, then who can we all together fall on our face before and ask? The man with the plan. It's the Master Jesus. He knows. So two things I know that we should as a church be engaging in just from this first section of Acts. Number one, we need to be waiting for God to reveal himself in power and we need to do so in intimate and devoted prayer. Are you with me? Are we in agreement? Four of us? Come on now. There weren't four disciples in an upper room. There was an agreement because they had all seen the resurrected Lord. 
I'm inviting you as the disciples of Jesus. You have, by faith, you have seen the resurrected Lord. And if he is the resurrected Lord, which means master, which means boss, and he says, here's what we're going to be doing now. It is our job not to try to parse it and see if we like the plan and see if it's comfortable. What is the job of a slave before their master when the master has commanded? What does a slave do? Yes, master. And we go do it. So I'm going to invite you, and it's, I'm not going to do this right away because I need, I need all of us to be massaging this and thinking this through and coming to some agreement on this. In the days ahead, I'm going to be inviting you to some different schedule type things that will focus us in the way that the early church had to be focused. Where I'm, I'm, This is going to be hard for me too, I assure you. I'm going to be calling you to join together in prayer in maybe ways we haven't before, at least not in my experience here. And it's not so that we feel righteous or feel holy. It's so, so that we can actually experience what that first church did, which is in the presence of God as a people, seek his face to what he's already promised to give us. And as His Spirit is poured out on us and we receive that power in a new and unexpected way, because we can't predict how it all will go, we're going to be knowing the next step after that and the next step after that. We are I don't think we're ever going to receive the entire thing. Here's the next 30 steps. Is that how you've experienced life with God? Let me lay out the entire thing for you. Is that how He's done it? Isn't it usually what He did in Acts chapter 1? Let me show you step 1. I might give you step 2. Once you get there, I'll show you where to go next. And here's the real question as I end. Do we trust him enough to live like that? Do you really rely on him enough to where if I take this one next step, not knowing the third step, he'll tell me when I need to know? That's where I've been. Lord, I think I trust you that much. Well, then do this. Well, can you give me maybe up to step four? <laughs> it's like, Take this step. I'll show you where to go from there. So if that bothers you, I'm with you. But what are we going to do? All we can do is trust our master. Listen to his voice. Do what he says and watch as he turns this world upside down, just like he did through those first disciples. And why would we expect that the church today would be any less powerful than the church then? Isn't it true of us what was true of them? We're before anything in our lives. Disciples of Jesus Christ.